Our Father, we thank you once more for your great love to us. We know the price that has been paid is infinite. We will be studying it forever. Bless us as we see how to receive the benefits. You've explained that clearly to us. May we listen to your angels, your appointed agencies, to instruct us in the truth. We pray now that we may not only hear, but that we may understand and then do. We thank you. Amen. We are looking at what God means by education. And so far we've seen it's not what man calls education. When uh, Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, education meant understanding what nature was saying about God. That's God's method. And the whole plan of salvation has never moved from that. The whole idea is communion with God. And that communion only comes from Him and His works. So we're trying to move through that understanding as we move into what real education is. Okay, we're going to pick up the book Education on page 28. You remember we were talking about Adam and Eve. They were made perfect. They looked like God. They looked like Jesus. They had a character like God. They were sinless. But then something happened. They chose to covet something that God had forbidden. Now that might not seem like such a big deal to us because we do that all the time if we're not Christians. All humans do that naturally. But Christianity takes us away from that. If we know something is forbidden by God, why should we mess with it? So let's begin. Education, page 28, it says, By sin, sin is transgression of the law. Now, we need to broaden our view of what those words mean. Some people think it, sin is just what the Ten Commandments say. But the Ten Commandments cover a lot more than, than the expression. Sin is anything that goes against the will of God. So let's look at this. By sin, man was shut out from God. Except for the plan of redemption, eternal separation from God. The darkness of unending night would have been his. So let's stop right there. We need to understand some things here that are not taught by Christianity today, and by none of the Sunday-keeping churches. Sin is against the law of God. So when the Sunday-keeping churches say the law of God has been done away with, they have destroyed sin. There's no more sin. How can you sin if there's no law? Well, if there's no sin... Because there's no law, then what do we need ministers for? <laughs> what do we need churches for? What do we need anything for if there's no sin? We don't need a redeemer. Do you see what the devil's done? No law, no sin, no Jesus. He did away with him. That's kind of fast, but that's the bottom line of where the devil is gone with this thing about you don't have to keep the law. And we have Seventh-day Adventists who believe that. They say, I'm going to get to heaven by my faith. Jesus kept the law for me. I'm sorry he didn't do that. We're going to have to understand a little bit more than what we've been thinking. So, it says, except for the plan of redemption. And people say, redemption means that Jesus died on the cross, now I can go to heaven. 
You're not going to find that in the Bible. And for Seventh-day Adventists, it's not in the spirit of prophecy either. Let's see what this sentence says. It says, except for the plan of redemption, eternal separation. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. And that's separation from everything besides God. Now, she says eternal separation. That means you don't get to come back. If Jesus had not died on the cross, nobody would be anything but dead. But because Jesus died on the cross and took everybody's place, their sin for them, that means everybody's going to be resurrected. Everybody, the whole world. And I don't know if you've ever heard that from a, a pulpit. But Jesus died to take the problem of sin away from everybody. That's redemption. Now we know not everybody's going to stay alive. That's why there's a second death. But we're not getting into that side of it right now. This one sentence just covers a lot of things. Except for the plan of redemption, eternal separation, the darkness of unending night. That's it. The human race is gone because of what Adam did. That means there are no innocent ones. I don't know why people go over there. They're leaving out a whole lot of gospel. All right. It says, through the Savior's sacrifice. Communion with God is again made possible. Now, that's the issue. Communion. Adam lost it. And Jesus has made a way for us to regain it. Communion with God. And that doesn't mean when Jesus comes back. It means right now, in this life. Right now. So, it says we may not in person. Oh, we can't do this in person. We can't approach Jesus' Father in person. Because if we try, that's the end of us. We'll die. Period. It says we may not in person approach into his presence. In our sin, we may not look upon his face. But we can behold him and commune with him. How? In Jesus. Everything is in and through Jesus. There are no side trips. There's no direct way to heaven. It's all through Jesus. And she uses the words, the Savior. Now, when somebody says the anything, are there any more than that? <laughs> Jesus is the Savior. There's no Holy Spirit Savior. And the Father himself, although he is the source of salvation through Christ, he did not hang on the cross. Jesus is the Savior, the one who did it, the one that bled, the one that died, the one that was resurrected. Okay, so it says, Jesus, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. So we don't know anything about God without Jesus. We know nothing about God without Jesus. Then I'm talking about God the Father here. So it says, the Word became flesh. The Word. Can we explain to somebody about the Word? It's very quick. It's John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning of what? It was talking about the creation of the earth. That's the beginning we're talking about. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, so there are two of them. And the Word himself was a God. He's divine. The word is theon in the Greek. 
The word was divine. And in verse 14 says, That word, that God that was with his father God, became flesh. So Jesus became a man. The Son of God became a man. But he didn't have two bodies. What kind of a body did he have? Only a human body because he no longer had his God body. And we say, well, what happened to it? <laughs> well, who knows what happened to it? He gave it up when he became a man. And so the only way he can live now is as a man, even though he's still in personality and in character, the son of God. Now, we're not going to move through that, but Alan White is assuming we understand all these things that she's writing. It's a bad assumption, I think. It says the life, the life of the Son of God in that man, she says the life and the death of Christ. Well, wait a minute. If the Son of God lived his life in that man, that human, because he was now a man himself, then who died? The Son of God as a human. You can't separate them. The Son of God, the divine being, and the human, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ on earth, are one person. There are not two people. Okay? It says that's the price of our redemption. What is our redemption? is to not be dead anymore. It's not going to heaven forever. That is not what she means by redemption here. She just told us that redemption is from being dead eternally. If we're resurrected, he saved us from being dead eternally. But he also saved Hitler from it and Stalin and everybody else. All right, so let's look at this carefully here. She says, uh, this is not only a promise, his death, a promise and a pledge of life, not only the means of opening again to us the treasures of wisdom, they are broader, higher revelation of his character than even the holy ones in Eden knew. So we get to understand more about Jesus than they did when they were sinless. Now listen carefully. While Christ opens heaven to man, she didn't say, while Christ gives them eternal life. She did not say that. She said, while Christ opens. Oh, there's an open door. What do you do with an open door? <laughs> you go through it. But if you don't go through it, what good is that open door? So Jesus opens it up. He makes it available. But nowhere in the Bible of the Spirit of Prophecy does it say, He paid the price and your ticket is sure you just, you belong in heaven now for every eternal life because Jesus died. The Bible does not teach that. The people who teach that say, Jesus did everything. But they leave off a couple of words. He did everything in terms of merit. None of us have any merit. Jesus has the only merit, but because he has the only merit, does it mean he does everything? He does everything in terms of merit. I want to ask you, I asked this question of one of our big preachers. He's not dead, but I still won't say his name. We were talking one day. And he's told me that Jesus has done everything. I have my ticket to heaven. He did everything. And I looked at him. I said, really? He did everything? You don't have to live your life anymore? And he looked at me. I said, I want to ask you a question. Who ate breakfast this morning? Did you do that or did Jesus do it? <laughs> he didn't want to talk to me anymore. 
<laughs> this simple little question. Who had breakfast this morning? You or Jesus? If you stop eating, is Jesus going to eat for you? It's just crazy how people who had degrees and, and talked to hundreds and thousands of people have forgotten how to think. Sin not only shuts us away from God, not only, is that enough? Isn't that enough? Sin not only. That's a big statement, sin not only. That's kind of like after Jesus died for us, much more than. Did you remember that one in Romans? Much more than he's died on the cross. That's what Paul said. Much more than the cross. You haven't heard that one for a while, I know. Well, I'm not going to finish the thought there. You go read Romans and see what he has to talk about there. But it says, sin not only shuts us away from God, but it destroys. It destroys in the human soul both the desire and the capacity for knowing him. Now, do you remember a few weeks ago we said, quoting Paul, that where sin reigned, what did that mean? Sin reigned. Sin is in complete control. You can do nothing against it. You're a slave to sin in the natural man. There is absolutely no hope for a natural human being. And so she says here, sin not only destroys the human soul, but it wipes out a human being's capacity to even desire to be saved, really. They have no capacity for knowing Jesus. Well, I hope you get what Ellen White's doing here. She's telling us something very important. All this work of evil, it is Christ's mission to undo the faculties of the soul, paralyzed, paralyzed. When Adam took us down, we all had a stroke with him and we're laying in the bed and there's nothing we can do. We can't even move our little finger. We have been wiped out. Sin has destroyed us as human beings. This is that darkened mind, the perverted will. He has power to invigorate and to restore. He opens to us. See, there's that word again. He opens. He doesn't just hand it over. He opens it. It's a possibility. He opens to us, and now there's something we didn't have before. We can do something. He opens to us the riches of the universe, and by him the power to discern and to appropriate these treasures is imparted. So from Jesus, he now takes away that paralysis and gives us something so we can understand a little bit about what this is about, and we can have a desire given to us by seeing what he's putting in front of us. We understand some of it now. Christ is the light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So now she's saying something I don't think we've understood yet. Every human on this planet is born with the problem. They have no capacity to know a Jesus. And now she says, but he is the light. And where does he put that light? Into every man. Every human gets something from Jesus. That's before the Christians. We have been told some bad stories. But every human has to have that horrible thing that's happened to him pulled away. 
And this is spirit prophecy. There are people that say, oh, you're talking about original sin. I don't want to get into that mess. People who talk about original sin don't have any idea what they're talking about. We're talking about the facts of the gospel. Every human is born with a problem. It's called darkness. It's called perversion. It's called separated from God. And Jesus died to take the death away from us that we deserve and open a door for us. Yes. And part of that open door is he gives us some light, his light, so that we all have capacity restored to us to begin hearing him. Now, she's not dealing with these things theologically. She's just saying facts. And we have been so far away from the gospel of Christ, we don't recognize what she's saying. As though, as through Christ, every human being has life, so also through his hymns, every soul receives some ray of divine light. There it is. She just said it. If we didn't get that from Jesus, nobody could be saved because we have no capacity to know him naturally. Uh, well, I almost got into a personal story here about how I received that light consciously when I was a rank sinner denying God all the time. But maybe we'll save that. Nothing strange about it. It's just that I recognized it. And it made me have a little capacity to ask some questions and to wonder, can this be true? Yeah. So this keeps staying with what she's doing here. Not only intellectual, but spiritual power a perception of right, a desire for goodness exists in every heart. Have you ever been told that? <laughs> That's right. The rank heathen walking up and down the streets here say, oh, those poor lost people. Yes, they're lost, but they are not lost eternally yet because Jesus has put something in them that if they pay attention to the drawing of the angels to Jesus, they can understand it. And they can begin weighing it. She said in every heart. And then she says, but. Oh, here we go. That word but just really destroys things, doesn't it? But against these principles, there is struggling and antagonistic power. The result of eating with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is manifest in every man's experience. So every human, there are no innocent ones. Every human participates in Adam and Eve knowing what happens after you eat from that tree. You now know what evil is. You now know what sin is. There is in his nature. I'm going to say it out flat here because there are people out there saying things they don't really understand. And I hope someday they're going to start paying attention to the whole Bible and not just their little stories. This is a nature problem. It is not a choice problem. None of us chose to be born on this planet. And there is not a single person born on this planet who doesn't have the problem of death. Yes, John the Baptist died, didn't he? People like to throw out John the Baptist and say, well, he was different. He was born in the Holy Spirit. Well, that's true, but that didn't stop him from dying, did it? People just don't follow all the way through. They just want to know their little peace. Well, the gospel is not one little piece. The gospel is harmony of everything in the scriptures and everything in the spirit of prophecy. There is in his nature, that's the word, it's a nature problem. 
There is in his nature a bent to evil. And people say, oh, but he hasn't done evil yet. Hey, what do you think the bent is? The bent is not a neutral thing. <laughs> How do you come up with a bent has nothing to do with evil? He wouldn't have the bent to evil if it wasn't his nature. It's a force. Paul calls it a rain. What is the force? It's Satan's spirit. That's the force. He gave that spirit to every human being born from Adam and Eve. That's the force. She says it's a force which, if unaided, he cannot resist. Now, if you cannot resist the bent that you had towards evil because it's your nature, what are you going to do? <laughs> are you going to do goodness and righteousness your whole life and never once ever do evil? How is that possible? You tell me how that's possible. Ellen White just said, you cannot resist it unless you get some help. Where's the help? Jesus is the only help there is. If you don't get Jesus, you don't have any help. This is so clear. I, I can't help but wonder how theologians write all those books that say nothing. And even people who read the Spirit of Prophecy all the time are misusing the Spirit of Prophecy in their talks. Yes. They're not understanding the issues. They're not understanding what sin really is because they have a sentence. Sin is a transgression of the law, but they're not understanding that sentence. She's laying it out for us here. It's so clear. And it's in the book Education, and we, uh, we haven't read more than a couple of paragraphs in this little part that we're reading today. So it says, to withstand this force, <laughs> To attain that ideal which in his inmost soul he accepts as alone worthy, he can find help in but one power. Are you hearing what she just said? What did she say? How many powers did she say? One. Now then, she says there are three powers in heaven. Yes, there are three powers. There is a heavenly trio, but she said there's only one. Oh, oh, did you hear that? There's only one power that can do us any good. Come on, you tell me who that one power is. <laughs> It's Jesus. That's the one power. There are not three powers that do this for us. The three powers are involved, but only Jesus can save us. The Father is power. Jesus is power. And the heavenly agencies that bring the Holy Spirit to us are the third power, called in the Bible, Holy Spirit. Now, I've never said it that way. There's a whole lot more that we're going to say about this before we're done, because there are people who want to argue, very few, but they're out there. I have received two letters so far out of the hundreds of people who listen to these. I've had two people get so confused, they say, we don't want to worship the Holy Spirit. Angels. You see, they're willing to worship a being called the Holy Spirit, which doesn't exist, but they don't want to ever worship angels. Well, that's true, we don't worship angels. Let me get that straight. Nobody can worship angels and not be in trouble with God. 
because angels are creatures. I don't have the slightest inkling of how a person can get over to the idea that because Jesus said the angels are holy, that if we agree with him, we're worshiping angels. I don't get that one at all. <laughs> but there are people out there who just don't get it, and we hope they do eventually. They need to stop rationalizing and just read what Jesus says, what the Spirit of Prophecy says, and if they don't understand it, they ought to pray for understanding instead of saying it's wrong. Jesus never makes mistakes. That power is Christ. She says it clear, straight out. Nobody can argue with it. says that power is Christ. Cooperation with that power is man's greatest need in all educational effort. She's been talking to us about education. In all educational effort, should not this cooperation be the highest aim? So this is why we have schools, is to teach people that Jesus is the only way past the problem. <laughs> there is no trinity. She just flat out said it. There's only one power. The true teacher. Oh, so there are some on this planet. The true teacher is not satisfied with second-rate work. He's not satisfied with directing his students to a standard lower than the highest which it is possible for them to attain. He cannot be content with imparting to them only technical knowledge. That's called theology. Who cares about theology? It says, with making them merely clever accountants, skillful artisans, successful tradesmen, it is his ambition to inspire them. The word inspire means God breathed. When we're inspired, it's because it came from God himself. All right, to inspire them with principles of truth, obedience, honor, integrity, and purity. Now, when you went to school, how many hours did you get on the subject of purity? How about the word obedience? How many hours did you get on that one? Integrity. Truth. I think you went to the wrong school. I did too. <laughs> I hated school. I'm not going to tell you all the reasons. I learned why after I became a Christian. I had a right to hate schools the way they're taught. And I didn't know it. <laughs> I don't know if any of you hated school, but I hated it. They couldn't hardly find me. They put me in classes. But that's another story. It says, he desires them above all else to learn life's great lesson of unselfish service. So there's a lesson we're to learn. Unselfish service. To who? Well, if you're serving yourself, that's not unselfish service. <laughs> unselfish service is for everybody else. These principles become a living power to shape the character through the acquaintance of the soul with Christ. So we are learning about Jesus and we learn about purity, truth, all the rest of it, obedience. We're learning about Jesus. Through an acquaintance of his wisdom as the guide, his power as the strength of heart and life, this union formed. When we find out where we're getting all the right information, finally, when we have this union, the student has found the source of wisdom. <laughs> and you know, when a person finds that, they don't look for it in a church. I just said that to 20 million people. They don't find it in a church. They don't find it in ministers. They don't find it in front of a TV set. They don't find it lots of places. There's only one place. Jesus Christ. He is the source 
of wisdom. And that's what education is for, is to bring us to that knowledge. Jesus is the source. He, the he here is us, he, everybody, has within his reach you mean to say, when I learned Jesus died on the cross and I believed it, that I'm not saved eternally? No, you're not. But we have it within our reach. Oh, it's within our reach. What do you have to do when something's within your reach? <laughs> You've got to take it. <laughs> So she says, he, us, has within his reach the power to realize in himself his noblest ideals. The opportunities of the highest education for life in this world are his. And in the training here gained, he's entering upon the course, which embraces eternity. This is how you get eternal life. You got to go to school first. And in the spirit prophecy, it's called the school of Christ. When you become a Christian, you've been born so you can go into that school, but you are not given a ticket for eternal life. You are on probation to learn how to live like a Christian, to be like Jesus. And when you get through that course, at the end of it, they're going to pull up your name. And they're going to look at your life history to see how did they do? Did they learn it or not? Nobody gets to heaven because Jesus died on the cross and that's it. We're going to take the course. We have to go to school. We have to learn. We have to communicate with Jesus. We have to have him in our hearts. We've got to live like we say we believe. If we don't live like we say we believe, it's a fake. In the highest sense, the work of education and the work of redemption are one. They're the same thing. True education and true redemption do the same thing. Other foundation can no man lay that in his laid, which is Jesus Christ. There it is. Do you know I say this at just about every meeting? It's all about Jesus. It's all Jesus. Now that doesn't say he did it all. I've never said that. I'm not going to say it. But salvation, redemption, education, everything, wisdom comes from Jesus. But who is it? that is supposed to understand and get wise. Is it him? No, it's not him. He's already wise. I'm the one that has to get wise. <laughs> I'm the one that has to get pure. I'm the one. Yes, me. I'm the one that eats breakfast. <laughs> Under changed conditions, now, you see, this education we're talking about, Jesus did in Eden. But then after Adam's sin, now a change has come. So now what do we do? Under changed conditions, true education is still conformed to the Creator's plan. The plan of education did not change just because Adam sinned. It's the same plan. The Eden School. Adam and Eve received instruction through direct communion with God. We, oh, here's the change. We don't have direct communion with God, Jesus' Father. That's God. And I don't know how many of you have talked to Jesus in person. I haven't done that one. You know why you haven't done it in person? Because now we... Behold the light of the true knowledge of his glory in the face of Christ. And we've been talking about it for many weeks now. 
What is our direct face-to-face -face contact with heaven every day? The angels. We have angels with us all the time. And Ellen White and the Bible both, if we're paying attention, tell us that angel, our guardian angel, is in the stead of Christ. Jesus has told that angel how to educate us, how to protect us, how to guide us, and the angel does it all. That's the commission. Hebrews 1.14, they are ministering spirits. What kind of spirits? Holy spirits. Yes, don't hide from that. When this is all over, everywhere in the universe, throughout God's entire creation and existence, every single living being in his kingdom will have a Holy Spirit. <laughs> that's the only kind of spirit that's going to be in his kingdom. Holy Spirit. And if you have a Holy Spirit, you are a Holy Spirit. <laughs> there are no other alternatives. I'm sorry. You can't find us something else to talk about. So we behold the light of the knowledge of his glory in the face of Christ. The great principles of, uh, of education are unchanged. They stand fast forever and ever, for they are the principles of the character of God. God can't change his character, so he can't change the way he educates. <laughs> to aid the student in comprehending these principles and in entering into the relation with Christ, which will make them a controlling power in the life, should be the teacher's first effort. His constant aim, the teacher who accepts his aim, is in truth a co-worker with Christ, a laborer together with God. The next chapter begins the system of education established in Eden, centered in the family. Oh, we're getting another part of it now. The family. Adam was the son of God. And it was from their father that the children of the highest received instruction. There, in the truest sense, was a family school. All right, I'm going to ask you the question. It's not a trick question. Who was their educator? She just said, their father. Who is their father? The answer should be getting easy about now. Jesus, he's their creator, he's their father, he's their teacher in school. The God, his father did not come down to teach them every day. It was Jesus who did that. And if you don't like my opinion, I will read it to you from the spirit of prophecy because it's not my opinion. I don't say things unless I've read them someplace. <laughs> okay? It says, uh, in the divine plan of education as adapted to man's condition after the fall, Christ stands as the representative of the Father. So she just said it. Their teacher is Jesus. He's their father. He represents his father. The connecting link between God and man. He is the great teacher. Who's he? Jesus. He represents the Father to fallen human beings. Did you hear what he said? She said, after the fall? She says, after the fall, Christ stands as a representative of the Father. After the fall, it's Jesus. And that's the way it is today and always. It's always Jesus. The Father does not deal with us directly. It's always Jesus. So when I say the Father that way, I mean His Father. He, Jesus is our Father. He ordained that men and women should be His representatives. Oh, Jesus represents the Father, and we represent Jesus. 
The family was the school and the parents of the teachers. The education setting in the family was that which prevailed in the day of the patriarchs. And I am beginning to think we're going back to those times. Organizations have failed us. It's time to get back to the way God told Adam and Eve, and that's the way the patriarchs did it. The family is going to be the church, home, and school. That's right. And men, I have to tell you something that's going to scare you out of your whatevers. You will become the priest of the family. You think about that one for a while. The people who were under his direction still pursued the plan of life that he had appointed in the beginning. Those who departed from God. Have you heard those words lately? I think you've heard those words. The spirit of prophecy uses those over and over about what was coming to this church. Those who have departed from God built for themselves cities. Oh, we're not supposed to live in cities. Yeah. There are people who wouldn't know how to live if they didn't live in a city. There are lots of people who wouldn't know how to live. That was not God's plan, cities. They congregated in them, glorified in the splendor, the luxury, the vice that makes cities of today the world's pride and its curse. But the men who held fast to God's principles in life, where did they live? In the fields, in the hills. Uh, <laughs> in the fields, in the hills. Oh man, oh what I do on a, in a can you just see me behind a plow with an oxen in front of it? <laughs> hey, that's God's education. We're starting to learn something now. It says the fields and the hills, they were tillers of the soil. They were keepers of flocks and herds. And in this free, independent life, what does she mean, free, independent life? You didn't sign a contract with somebody that if you made so many of these a day or so many an hour, they would pay you 50 cents an hour or whatever. That's not independent when you work for somebody and you better do what they say or you get fired. Yeah, that's not independent. She says independent. You have your own piece of ground. You have your own cow, your own ox, your own horses, your own sheep. And you work the ground, and it feeds you. This is God's plan. Oh, how far away are we from God's plan? We think just because we go to church on the right day, we're in God's plan. I'm sorry we're not. We have barely begun to learn what the real plan of salvation is. Just barely. We think because we discovered there's a father and there's a son, now we can go to heaven. Sorry, folks. <laughs> there's just a whole lot more than knowing there's a father and a son. We're trying to get to it. They were tillers of the soil, keepers of flocks and herds. This free independent life with its opportunities for labor and study and meditation. They learned of God and they taught their children the works, his works and ways. This was the method of education that God desired to establish in Israel. And we're going to get to Israel before we're done here. But what God did in Eden and even after sin, he wanted that to be established. And we're going to see how he did it in Israel. But when brought out of Egypt, there were among the Israelites few. That word crops up now. Few. That's spelled F-E-W, and it's blue all the way through my computer. Every time I see few, I see blue. Few. That means a tiny little bit of people. Few. But few. When uh, they were prepared to be workers together with him. 
Are there still only few who work with Jesus to save souls? Are there still only few? Why? She's going to tell us. She's going to tell us right here. It says the parents themselves needed instruction. I know my parents did. What about yours? <laughs> my parents didn't know anything about this. And I just barely started to understand some of it myself <laughs> with all this information God has given. The parents themselves needed instruction and discipline. Victims of lifelong slavery. And we say, oh yeah, those poor Jews, 400 years of slavery. Uh, I want to ask you, how long have we been in slavery? Problem, isn't it? We were born slaves. Are there people who say, no, you were born innocent. You didn't become a slave until years later when you chose to sin. I'm sorry. That's not true. We were all born slaves. She says they've been in slavery for so long, lifelong. I think ours is lifelong too until we meet Jesus. Lifelong slavery until Jesus. And then we become servants. Servants of what? Servants of righteousness. They were ignorant. Ooh, we better move that word they out of the way. I was ignorant of Jesus. I was ignorant of righteousness. I was ignorant of everything about God. They were ignorant, untrained, degraded. They had little knowledge of God, little faith in him. They were confused by false teaching. Oh, has that happened? <laughs> false teaching. False teaching from who? The heathen? What do we care what heathen think? False teaching from the church. Yeah, false teaching. And they were corrupted by their lifelong contact with heathenism. They're entertained by that little box that sits in their house that all the heathen have. Yeah, and I can tell you about a lot of other things the heathen do. God desired to lift them to a higher moral level and to do this, to this end he sought to give them a knowledge of himself. Knowledge of God and him who he sent. That we're back to John 17, 3. The whole plan of salvation is in that verse. All right, we're going to have to wrap up here. It says, in his dealings with the wanderers in the desert, in all their marchings to and fro, in their exposure to hunger, thirst, and weariness, in their peril from heathen foes, in the manifestation of his providence for their relief, God was seeking to strengthen their faith by revealing to them the power that was continually working for their good and having taught them to trust in his love and power. It was his purpose to set before them in the precepts of the law. Did you ever wonder why it took him so long to give them the law? <laughs> the law Adam knew the law. He didn't create the law, but he made it known to the Israelites at a certain point in their experience. He had to get them to trust him first. And after they trusted him now, he could tell them about the law. It says, the standard of character. They could see now what his standard of character is. It's the law. The law is how they're to live because it will make them like him. The standard of character that through his grace, he desired them to attain. So why did the Seventh-day Adventist church teach us the law? They don't know why. They thought it was to get us to keep the Seventh-day Sabbath. That's not the reason. It's so we could understand the character of Jesus and the character of his father so that we could understand they want us to be like them if we keep the law we will be like jesus all of this
this is the book education. All these wonderful truths, and we don't see them when we're by ourselves that easily because we were brainwashed to believe in a different gospel than the gospel of Jesus Christ. We just have to really ask the angels to help us because we're not going to get this by ourselves. And we're not going to get it trusting men. It's not going to happen. It costs Jesus too much to let us just wander around by ourselves. He has ways of getting our attention. You know, when I was in the hospital a while back, I was there for 30 days and they didn't even close me up. I was all open. They were waiting for me to heal from the inside out. <laughs> so for 30 days I was laying there and I couldn't move. Where could I go? My insides would come out. <laughs> I was laying in that bed. And the thought really hit me as a practical reality. You know, I've got nothing to do but look up. <laughs> And that was an absolute reality, and I realized, you know, maybe, maybe we all need to look up. <laughs> Father, we're so thankful that we're still alive. It's not too late. We can learn, but we must learn your way. You're revealing to us your method. We can't just go outside and walk past all the trees and all the grass and, and whatever dirt is left. It's all covered with concrete and block top. In the cities, where is the nature? But you have left nature for us to look at, to study, to understand. There are animals, there are insects, there are stars, there's the sun, there's the moon. There's enough. Help us, Lord, to understand. We're supposed to open our eyes. We're supposed to see and we're supposed to think with our brain. Bless us as we begin listening to your holy angels who have our commission to teach us your truth. May we hear your voice through them. And may we know we're only a a second away from heaven at any time because they have direct access to you. We thank you that we're learning. Amen.